Imagine yourselves on safari in Tanzania, in the Serengeti National Park. You're in your safari car whizzing by on a dirt road, the wind blowing through your hair. You picnicked by hippos, hiding their heads beneath the surface of a river, and spotted the cheetah on its perch from over a hundred yards away. You photograph the lion resting with her herd, and as you're there in your safari car, you look out the window and are in awe of the geographic treasure of the Serengeti. You close your eyes and go to your happy place. Ha ha, happy place. Thoughts of work start to drift away. You feel so connected to the land and you feel so present and moved by the moment. It feels as though you're not moving at all. Ah. Then you open your eyes and you realize that you're actually not moving at all. There's smoke coming out of the hood of your safari car. The engine gasket has blown, and you are no longer in your happy place. Two hours later, you're in the same spot, psychologically a little bit worse off. The tsetse flies are swarming around your legs. The air is getting colder, and that setting sun seems more ominous than beautiful. You also have a sneaking suspicion that that leopard you spotted earlier is now spotting you. <laughs> huh. So you take stock of the situation. What's going on here? You're 50 miles away from the main road. Food and water are running low. Patience is long gone, and you're trying to figure out what to do next. Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you have a job like mine, you have 13 students in your care. That's other people's children who trusted you to take them home safely. I was sweating, fully aware of the fact that my silly red hat, yep, that's me up there, was not going to help get us out of this situation. That was me three years ago. My name's David Miller, and I'm the Director of Global Studies at Deerfield Academy with over a decade of experience in taking teenagers abroad. So although I stood nearby, trying to seem part of that huddle of people with mechanical prowess, of which I was not one, eventually, about a half an hour later, our safari car driver told me in about an hour, a new vehicle would be on the way, and we would be able to make it back safely at the end of the day. So I took a moment to take stock of our group and consider the reality of risks in the situation. I thought about the concerns that parents had sending their children to rural Tanzania. They were worried about terrorism. They were worried about infectious diseases. They were worried about kidnapping. And the reality is those things are very scary, but in that moment broken down on the side of the road in the Serengeti, those risks were so unlikely and so, so far away. We were there in that moment, surrounded by tsetse flies, lions, and at least one leopard. Now, as I said, we didn't have the ability to start our cars again or hide anywhere special. I didn't have any weapons, luckily. But I did have a lot of insect repellent. And so we decided to apply it liberally. There you go. <laughs> Knowing it would help with at least one of the issues we had that we were facing. We also had a lot of hand sanitizer. I might hurt someone here, be careful. And last but not least, sunscreen, which we put all over our faces. Whoa! Okay, survived that moment. <laughs> All right. It wasn't the flies or the lions or the environmental con security concerns that we needed to be worried about at that moment. Those risks were manageable. We were covered in chemicals and had plans for most types of things that could go wrong. But there was something 
that we did have to be worried about. The possibility that the vehicle coming our way didn't have seatbelts and would be, we would be traveling on the road at night. You see, in Tanzania, you're 50 times more likely to be in a fatal car accident than you are in the United States. And we were about to get on the road with very few lights and even fewer traffic regulations. This story has a happy ending. The safari car that came to get us had enough seatbelts for all the students, and we made it home safely with a good story to tell ourselves. Risks are real. Things happen. But there's also a reality to the fact that we're generally worried about the wrong things. We spend so much time being worried about looking for ISIS that we forget to look for the smoke detectors in our hotel rooms. We're overly concerned about Ebola over 3,000 miles away that we forget to be concerned enough about the lack of seatbelts on roads that claim thousands of lives every year. We're worried about the leopard instead of the lack of water. There is no such thing as the ultimate safety. Risk is real. Things happen. But we have to learn how to measure the severity and likelihood of different occurrences. Things like ISIS and Ebola exist very large in our imaginations, and those risks, they are real. We have to think about them, but we also have to put them in perspective and realize that there are things that are very likely to happen on our trip. So let's take a moment, look to your left, look to your right. If you were to go on a trip as a trio right now in a rural destination abroad, one of those two people would likely get traveler's diarrhea. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Things happen. That's part of travel and that's part of the value of travel. In this case, our safari car, thinking about likelihood and severity, what we needed to focus on was transportation. That was the risk that we needed to manage. Now, we have to learn how to do this work well, manage risks appropriately, and there are things that we need to learn about risk and travel before we ever set foot on a plane so we can prepare adequately. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Risk is the potential to lose something of value. And as we get more and more afraid of the world, we have the very real potential to lose something that has tremendous value, the motivation to travel at all. But in the same way that we're worried about the wrong type of imaginary risks, we often also focus on the wrong types of value you get by traveling. It's not about the beauty of a safari or the color and warmth of a Colombian village or the memories made with friends. Travel is not just a powerful experience for the individual or an opportunity to find the perfect Facebook profile picture. Travel is also an urgent, collective, global need. The world is rapidly changing, and in that change exists very real risks. Islamophobia, food insecurity, illiteracy, lack of access to clean water, and climate change. These are the real risks we must face unless we are prepared to lose things of tremendous and necessary value. So what do we do now? Those risks are likely. Those risks are severe. And they are worth worrying about. What we need are global citizens who are prepared to lead and curious, critical, and skilled travel can help be a key part of that preparation. Travel allows us to move from assumption and fear to experience 
and empathy. When we travel to Jordan, we have an opportunity to better understand the Middle East, from fears of terrorism to experiences of peace, from oasis to desert, and from foreigner to friend. When we travel to Kenya, we learn that Africa is a continent full of a rich diversity of cultures. We see mud huts, but we also see vibrant cities. And instead of those horrible images on terrible TV commercials of hopelessness and poverty trying to get you to give donations, we have the opportunity to meet with the entrepreneurs and innovators from small villages and large universities that are working every day to create a better future. In Colombia, we learn that it is not a country of drug lords, yet as the Ministry of Tourism recently explained, the only risk is not wanting to leave. If we travel to the Bahamas, we can learn that it is not just a destination, but a sovereign nation. And we have the chance to learn the stories of the people working behind the scenes in the tourism industry. All of these places are filled with individuals, with individual needs and individual desires. And by traveling, we have the opportunity to make the connections that will make this world just a little bit smaller. Now, before I go on, let me be clear that not all travel leads to the development of empathy. In fact, there's a lot of horrible travel going on right now in the world, probably right at this moment today. But that's a whole nother TED Talk. What I can say with confidence is if you start with a curious person who's interested in learning new things, you generally get pretty good outcomes. Well, I believe that empathy is at the core of a better future, it alone is not enough. We need to go from seeing obstacles to understanding systems. Instead of seeing a problem and being paralyzed, a good, curious, and sophisticated traveler can step, step back and see the con context of systems within which that problem exists. Whether it's access to clean water in Tanzania, or the economics of the tourism industry in the Dominican Republic, we have a chance to learn about the connections between local and global communities. When we travel to Colombia and see the impact of climate change, we also have a chance to think about the carbon footprint of our own flight in arriving there. If we travel well, we start to think about the impacts, both positive and negative, that we have on the economic, environmental, and cultural systems with which we interact. Now, once we have empathy and an understanding with, of systems, we're prepared to develop the skills to solve real problems. Whether it's going through customs or learning how to speak a second language, the opportunities for rapid skill development abroad are plentiful. From navigating new cultures to navigating new subway systems and from finding that bathroom in one of those special emergencies we talked about a little bit earlier to realizing that a safari car breakdown does not have to end in crisis. The opportunities to solve real problems and develop our skills happen every day when you're traveling abroad. And perhaps of all of those different skills to solve the world's most pressing problems, the most important is learning how to ask the right questions. So why travel? If we travel well, we return with more empathy, more understanding of systems, and the skills to solve problems big and small. There are very real risks in traveling, but there's a risk in not traveling at all. I spoke this week with Anne and Charles Shuey. Their daughter, Sarah, who you can see on the far right of the photo behind me, graduated from Deerfield in 1993. Sarah was near the top of her class academically, at the top of her game in tennis, squash, and field hockey. Sarah was also an accomplished photographer and painter 
who found her passion for the arts in the very same building we're sitting in today. 20 years ago next month, Sarah was tragically killed in a bus crash in India. The bus did not have any seatbelts. After experiencing unimaginable loss, Anne and Charles Shuey founded Sarah's Wish Foundation to honor their daughter. They've done tremendous work in a project to try to retrofit seatbelts on buses. They've been fierce advocates for safety awareness, both in international travel and in this country. And maybe most importantly, they've given 175 scholarships for young women to travel to pursue their humanitarian goals. We need to get better at managing risk in study abroad and in international travel. But we also need global citizens who are prepared to take on the world's most pressing problems. There are a lot of risks you can imagine when traveling abroad, but we have to make sure that we never lose sight of our values. I wanna leave you with some words from Anne and Charles Shuey. Know before you go, they said, but don't forget to go. So let's focus on the real risks and seek out the meaningful value. Pack your bug spray, put on your seatbelt, stay curious, and keep traveling well. Thank you.